All right, Randy. So we are here because this week, and in fact, I'm going to be releasing this on what is publication day for my first novel, I Am Justice, and you were my main editor for it. So just background for everybody who knows, I drafted the original version of the book, um, I guess in late uh, 2019 and early 2020, and then um, worked with a bunch of different beta readers and you know people who gave me editorial feedback, and then I sent it in to StoryGrid, which we'll talk about. And and you were my main editor, and at that point I was like, great, you know, we'll do a a round of polishing, and then we'll get this thing published, you know, because by that point I had already done five or six drafts, I think at least, and. Uh, the experience went a little bit different. We, I think, ended up probably doing six or seven big rewrites, either of the whole thing or pieces of it. Um, and I'll talk, I want to talk more about that experience, but I'll just say that in the end, I think it turned out really amazing. And one of the reasons why was the, the kind of input and feedback and encouragement that you gave um, to the project. And I've always said that for every, all my books, I owe so much to the editors, but this is definitely true here because this is, you know, my first real foray into fiction. I'd written some earlier things that never saw or will see the light of day. Um, but this really helped me kind of learn uh, how to go from something that was promising to something that I think uh, I'm certainly proud of. The early reviews are looking good. So I think other people are enjoying it. But um, so first of all, uh, thank you. You're welcome. I, I actually don't think I ever saw any of, I didn't see any of the other, I mean, I saw the final product that came to me, but I'm really curious what the other editors said. Um, Cause I've had other people come to me after they've seen editors too. And, but I don't, I never actually see what the other editors say. So I don't know what I'm doing different than them, except that we, I disagree with the final product and I just give better, I give suggestions from what I, my standpoint, but no, I was honored to be a part of this. Um, I think in, I could be wrong, but I think we were one of the first published books with StoryGrid that was done not with Sean Coyne, the creator of StoryGrid. Um, so we were that we were the kind of the trial, you know, dummy for the StoryGrid publishing, and uh, they're very happy with the way it turned out. And so. We're going to move on from there. It, it was a really, it was a great experience. It, was, it wasn't anything like I was normally done before either, because most people come to me and they give me a manuscript and I give you, I give them the feedback that I give to you. And then I never see them again. Um, and then except for one, one came back four times and then she got a publisher within a month. And so that was a really good, that was a really good uh Good for me because I was like, oh, yeah, finally someone came back and they, as far as I don't know if anyone else published, I've, I've done 40 <laughs> manuscripts and they never came back to me. So I don't, I don't know what happened after that. And they didn't, you know, they didn't write me and say, I got published. Thank you. So I'm assuming either I didn't help them or they didn't do it. But, but I have, uh, I, I ghost wrote another book this year uh, for another gentleman. Uh, and that, that, that got picked up for publishing in January. And, uh, and then I have another nonfiction book that I've edited that edited slash goes for it. And that's going to come back, come out next year as well. So you, you, I was doing yours in the middle of all that. And, uh, and it was good to have a really good fiction book because I love fiction and to, to work on it. So I appreciate the, uh, did you interview other story good editors or and choose me or did I choose you? I don't know. Um, well, I want to come to that because it's a kind of an interesting story. I, I should say, I didn't get um, editorial feedback from many other story grid editors. Uh, all of the editors were kind of pre story grid, but just to take a little step back. So maybe you could give some background. Um, you know, how did you get involved in writing, editing, and maybe even kind of what led up to that? What, what did you spend most of your career doing? So my, I spent uh, 32 years in the military as an airborne ranger, uh, where a third ranger battalion, alpha company who and uh, I jumped into Panama in 89. I joined in 87. This was one of the first things I did when I was in the military. And, uh, and then after I recovered from my, I got wounded in Panama. And after I recovered from my injuries a year later, I went to the Q course for the Green Berets and passed. And I was a Green Beret for the rest of my career for the next 
20 some years. And, uh, and then, uh, but I always loved reading. I've always been a, a voracious uh, reader and uh, I've read, I mean, when I, for when I was growing up, I read fiction and science fiction and, and adventure books. Um, but, uh, when I got in the army, I started reading more nonfiction. Uh, but I, but I always had my, 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 my peers would like bring the VCR because we had VCRs back then and like uh, just trunk fulls of videos that everyone collected to watch. And I would bring a trunk full of books. And I said, these are the books I want to read on this six month trip we're going to do to El Salvador to train the nar- the, uh, the police against the narco traficantes. And every night I, I, you know, every week I'd read a book or two. And um, so I, I always read and then I always, I wanted to write. So I got my master's in creative writing in the military, thanks to the military for relatively almost for free from the University of Texas. And, uh, and that was my goal when I was going to retire. I thought I'd retire a lot earlier, but I, then I did, but, uh, but uh, I, I, I went in for 32 years. I, I was editing when I was in the master's program. And then afterwards I would edit, I would edit, I would edit stuff, but I was doing it kind of half time, part time weekends, nights and stuff. And then I got out and I, uh, I, my thesis for the uh, master's program was a book and it took me two years to write. I had to keep extending my thesis because it was a 350 page war novel and I was halfway through it. And I just talked to my, the guy, he's like, Hey, you got to finish It's two years. You got to finish. And I was like, well, I'm listening to this story broad podcast and I got some other ideas. Do I have to actually, is there a word count or do I have to finish the book? Cause everyone else is turning in like a list, a, a collection of short stories that are like a hundred pages and mine's 350 pages long. And he's like, you have to finish the story. You don't have, <laughs> I mean, you can make the story as short as you want, but the story has to be finished. There has to be a beginning, middle and end. I was like, Jesus. So I, I, I delved, I dove into the story grid. I finished the last 150 pages in like a month and I turned it in. And when I did, when I had to defend my book, which was the weirdest thing. I had to go before <laughs> these, these professors and they read it and then they would, and if there, everyone, all my peers were really nervous about it. I was like, it's my book. What are they going to ask me? I, I'll do to tell them exactly what my characters are thinking because I wrote the book. How hard can this be? And I was exactly right. And they were just interested in how I wrote the book. And uh, they said, you know, the end's a lot different. The last 150 pages are amazing. The beginning is a little slow start and everything like that. And I was like, well, that means the story grid worked. <laughs> And then, uh, and then I saw them advertise. Um, so I got my master's, and then I saw that they're advertising an editor, uh, a, uh, a editor certification for the Story Grid. But I didn't read it. I just saw Story Grid training is what I saw in my head, and uh, and I and I and I. So I I, uh, I I got out of the army and uh, I went over there. I, I signed up for it. And I was living in Europe at the time. I was living in Italy. So I flew back to go to it. So it was actually, you know, the price was not cheap. And then on top of that, I had to pay for a plane plane ticket and hotels and everything else. But I I really believed in it. And I got there and we did get training in how to use the story good better. But there was other training the editing training, which where they were teaching you how to be an editor or work for Story Grid as a contractor, and they would feed you clients that were interested in Story Grid, and it was really amazing. And I was like, oh, I could do this as a job if I writing doesn't, if I my writing takes a while to work out. That's kind of cool. So as soon as I got out, three months later, after I finished all their certification processes, I opened a web page up and I started editing, and uh, that was five years ago. What? So, yeah, so I've, I've done 40 books since then, nonfiction, fiction, ghostwriting, things I never thought I would be doing that that apparently I have a knack for. And uh, it's been a really amazing ride, and I'm able to make a living doing it, and I love it. And uh, I love – I actually learn stuff from all my writers, like, oh, uh, and, I, and I bring f- stuff from the other writers to this, like, hey, th- I saw a similar problem. We fixed it this way, things like that. And um, – I believe in the story grid. I believe there's a lot of stuff from all the different, uh, you know, ways, the methods out there, like the, you know, save the cat and stuff. They all bring a little bit to it. And I've read all those books and my masters helped me a little bit too, but, uh, but the story grid is my primary way I do everything. In fact, 
uh, the for those of the if anyone's familiar with the story grid that's listening to this or watching this, um, the spreadsheet and the full scap. I have to turn that in next Monday. That com- it's going to be the what you did to apply for story grid. Mm-hmm. Well, since your story changed significantly. I have to do it from my perspective as the editor, and they're going to put it up, I believe, on the webpage, the Story Grid webpage, once your, your book's published or out there on the market. It's already already done. So I'm finishing that up right now. So but yeah, anyway, so for that- people who don't know, so I hopefully uh, I should be able to have Sean Coyne, who um, created the Story Grid, has a book by that name and uh, is one of the two people who are responsible for publishing the novel um we'll go into great depth with him i think about kind of what story grid is i'll give kind of my summary and then given that you're more of an expert than i am randy maybe you can say a little bit more or at least what you find so powerful in it and basically it's kind of a methodology for how to i think the inception of it was a methodology for how you can edit yourself and so um a, a one of the most popular books, and I think it's a really good book um, by, is it Robert McKee uh, called Story? Story. It, it has some amazing principles, but it's not it, that usable. Um, and there's a lot of books like that. They give you kind of tips and tricks and so on, but it doesn't really give you a method, a system that you can use to really make sure that you can judge your work objectively and think, does this actually work? Does this tell a story that's going to be satisfying to a reader? And so what Sean did was really create tools that allow you to apply the kind of principles of storytelling and judge a work by, okay, is this really executing in a way that's going to satisfy and surprise readers? So I'll, I'll just uh, piggyback with what you said. Um, So Sean Coyne, 30 years in the editing uh, with different um, agencies and uh, um, just responsible for helping editors or for authors make incredible books. You know, you know, a lot of Stephen Pressfield books, Sean Coyne edited and a, a, just a plethora of other famous authors that people would recognize. I just don't know off the top of my head what they are. Um, and then so he wrote this book, which was when he went to the publishing industry, there was no, like in the military, we call it standard operation procedures. There's no SOP. There is no, this is how you become an editor. It was like, okay, read a book and tell us if you think it'll be successful and why, and, and we'll figure it out. But there's no method to their madness. Every single editor and all his mentors had their own methods, but there was no standardized method for coming out of college or or whatever, any kind of training and saying, this is a great method to determine if the book works and if it's going to be successful, if people will like it, if it meets all the, if it satisfies the reader. So after reading, I don't know, millions, at least thousands, tens of thousands of books and and, ed- and editing them and deciding if they're any good, he came up with his own system. And it's mostly best based on genre. And he divides every, every system seems to divide genre up a different way, including the publishers and the bookshelves in Barnes and Nobles, however long that's going to exist and Amazon, you know, they, they put it in, they put, you know, Hey, this is going to, this is a fantasy genre, this, but he divides it up into um, 12 different genres. And, uh, and then what he did is he would dive in to read like the top hundred books of that and come out with commonalities that, of conventions that a mystery, a crime story uses, or an action or a love story. And he would, uh, and conventions that, that almost every single one of these had in some form, right, uh, for the different genres. And, um, and that's where his book comes from. And he discusses point of view, and he discusses theme, like, like most books do save the cat, you know, the, the, the story, uh, story proof and all these other ones discuss these things as well, which they're real. He admits they're really important and he discusses them as well, but his primary chapters that are kind of new for me, especially I didn't learn any of this thing in my master's program was your genres have your readers of those genres. When they pick up a book and read the back of your book, they have a certain expectation when they read, Hey, you know, it's Jack Reacher or, it's, you know, Game of Thrones. When they read the back of the book, they, they're seeing a, you know, an action book, a thriller, a society book, some, some kind of, some kind of uh, book like that. And they have read books like this before. So they have an expectation that 
if it's a Jack Reacher type book, which is similar to what you've written, there's going to be action and suspense. And what's what's what I expect to happen is there'll be a life or, life or death situations where the character is going to have to make decisions and and dodge bullets and things like that. And those are the the conventions and, and obligatory scenes that I expect to see in there. If I don't see at the end of the book a bad guy being confronting the good guy, I think I'll I'll feel cheated a little bit. You know, if I if I actually want to pick up that kind of book and read that, that's the kind of book I want to read. And so he identifies those to help the authors create books that will satisfy the readers. Uh, and and um, I think it works really well. It doesn't work for every book in the world, but all the great stories, including Star Wars and Harry Potter, they all kind of fall into this story grid. And uh, and so the the really the really successful books, if if you want to take them apart by the story grid, which I highly recommend in order to learn it better, you'll see that all those conventions and all those all those obligatory scenes are in there. And most important, he has these things called the five commandments of the acts and the five commandments of the scenes, which I think is super important. It's one of the only systems uh, I sit I, the programs I, I processes that I see out there where you can apply what he calls the five commandments to each scene and make the scenes more compelling, which makes the reader want to read the next scene, which is really important nowadays because people, and I'm one of them, I'll pick up a book off Amazon, especially off, you know, uh, Amazon Prime, I get the free ones every now and then or whatever. And I'll start reading the first chapter or two or three. I'll even give it three times, three sometimes. And I'm like, I'm, I don't, I'm bored. I don't like this. I don't, I don't, I'm not in, I'm not in the book. And so the idea is that, you know, you hook the reader, you got an inciting incident that's really exciting, an attack of the villain or something like that. And then your scenes build on each other and they pertain to the plot and they're compelling in their own right. So you read this scene, you're like, that was a great scene. And then you want to read the next one. It's like, that was a great scene too. And they don't all have to be full of action, but they have to be full of choices, full choices for your protagonist of, of that specific scene in order to for the reader to get involved in why they're making the choices and learn more about your character. Because you, when your character makes choices, you're developing that character for the reader and showing what kind of person that character is. If I run from a fight, that's the I'm a coward. That's the kind of person I am. And then maybe during the, the book, I'll change and I'll become more brave. Or if I decide to fight, but I'm not ready to fight, then I'm kind of rash and maybe overconfident. And then maybe I'll change as I go along and I'll be more more I'll hold myself back a little bit because I, don't, I have other responsibilities. And if I die, then I can't take care of those responsibilities. And those are the, that's the development of the book. So I, well, I grew, well, I, I, cause I'm glad you raised this. So this was to me, the thing that grabbed me about story grid and the reason that I became so interested in learning about it, which is I had started writing a novel in 2016 or 17, I guess 2017, this is like the first serious novel I tried to write. And I realized I don't know what a book is. I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what a story is. I know that there's a beginning and then a bunch of stuff happens and then there's an end, but I didn't really know, like, what do you put in the middle? And that's a common question. But I, I for me, the question was to answer what happens in the middle, it has to be, well, what is it you're trying to do? What is a story? And the big insight that I got for Sean, the first one that grabbed me was that um, it, that a you know story is about change. And this is the kind of five commandments of it. What does change mean in that context? It's that, you know, you have a person going about their normal life, something happens to shake things up and make their old way of doing things you can't you can't fall back on that anymore something has to give so you come up with your strategy that you're going to adopt to deal with this new this new thing that's rocked the boat for you and that doesn't work things are getting harder and then you face a kind of choice that you have to make of all right i you know i think he divides into two kinds of choices right you have your least bad choice like you have all of these bad options and you have to figure out which one is the least bad or irreconcilable goods it's if i do this i lose that and that's desirable if i do that i lose this and this is desirable and that's what reveals characters reveals what the character's values are what really drives them and then that you know, leads to a climax and a resolution. But the big insight was not just that that was a story, but that that kind of structure of change penetrates from the largest scale of the story as a whole down to the down to a scene, all the way down to a single beat. That there, there's that whole kind of structure 
is in good stories um, at takes place at every level. And once I understood that, then I understood, okay, this is, this is what I'm doing. I'm trying to execute that in a way that is uh, consistent with my genre. No, I, yeah, I agree completely. And, and really the thing that I help authors the most with is, I mean, they may have gone through a couple of editors to get the big story kind of working, but I, I, I bring up, I, the, inevitably they're missing a couple of obligatory scenes that are in, in this kind of genre. And so I bring that to their attention and, uh, and then really I, I nail down each, each scene in each chapter for them and say, look, there's not a lot happening in this chapter. It's like, well, this chapter is telling you, you know, about the, how the turtle died. And I was like, yeah, but how does that affect the whole story? And has the character, does the character doesn't care about his next door neighbor's turtle? He didn't change at all in this chapter. So why should the, um, why should the reader care? If the, if the character doesn't care, why should the reader care? Uh, and that, and that's a, that's a big thing I, 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 uh, I try to help my authors with. So yeah. So, I mean, when I first drafted the novel, I generally had a pretty good knack for scenes. Um, but the major thing that happened, the, the kind of starting feedback I got from somebody um, was that I had sort of sacrifice character to plot, right? I had this kind of like compelling, clever plot, but nobody could care about it because my character was kind of doing things for the sake of the plot. And that's how I wrote it too. It's like, oh, I need to get her to X place. And so she would do it without really stepping back and going, All right, would, would this character really do that? Given who she is, given what she cares about, given kind of the state of her psychology, given what's happened in the story so far, is that realistically what she would do? And so um, it often wasn't, or at least it wasn't clear to the reader why she's doing it. And so they would become kind of disengaged. So that was like the first breakthrough where I got, okay, like you, you need a compelling plot, you need excitement, you need surprise, but if it doesn't flow out of a character, it's not going to connect. And so I did a lot of work to fix that. And um, there, I think a lot of smaller things that came about and I'm trying to remember by the time it reached you, I think a lot of the, there was a, a, a lot of small stuff we dealt with at the scene level. Um, but I think a, surprisingly, we spent a lot of time surprising to me. I think a lot of time getting the beginning, right. And getting the ending, right. Right. And uh, it, it was really about, and, and I think one way to think about that um, gives me a chance to address something you've said. So you've mentioned uh, ob obligatory moments uh, a few times. And I think some of my listeners will probably chafe at that and think that sounds like un being unoriginal. It sounds like, uh, oh, there's this... Um, you know, standard thing that you just have to copy what everybody else is doing. But I think what you said and the way that uh, I think about it is, you know, like, look, a story is a promise and every genre has certain promises. And the, that doesn't mean that it's um, people want to see what they've seen before. No, they want to see something different, but that means different ways of satisfying those promises a surprising way that the hero, you know, uh, is at the mercy of the villain and escapes or doesn't, you know, a, a surprising, um, uh, you know, a, a new kind of intense ticking time clock that's, you know, counting down how long they have till uh, the world goes to hell unless they solve the problem. You want those promises executed in new original ways, um, but those promises have to be there and have to be kept because that's inherent in whatever genre that you're writing. And so I think a lot of what we were working on is sort of like, all right, what promises are we setting up at the beginning that are going to engage the reader? And then are we really paying them off at the end? And I think that was a lot of the hard work as far as I remember it in terms of what we were doing. No, I, that that's absolutely correct. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, you're kind of a, I mean, you, you said you. I remember an email when you asked me to come on your podcast. It was, uh, I'm, you know, even though it might have been difficult, I thought you did. We did an excellent job, you know, bringing our my book to the next level. But you're actually one of my favorite because you favorite people to edit because you actually we discussed it. It's not like you just said I'm not going to do that because you're full of baloney. We said you said all right. Why did you say that? And I said it this way. It's like mm, I can see that. 
I'm not, I'm not fully on board with your changes, but I do have some ideas and you went forward with them. And, and I, that's all, all I can ask of a writer. It's, it's your creation. And I, I can't see everything that's in your head and, I, and what your goals are with this. Um, we talk about it. We talk about what your goals are, but you still got some, some, some cobwebs in there that I, I, I can't, I can't reach. Um, and, and the author that got published was just like you. She, I, I, I wrote the same kind of report that I wrote for her that I wrote for you, which is really detailed with a, just a bunch of suggestions. And they're just suggestions. I, I don't know how you really want to change this. I'm just like, consider this or that or that or that, you know, but I didn't accept, expect you to accept them all because you have your own ideas. And that's the, and, and, but I have authors that say, okay, if I change all this, it'll be perfect. It's like, well, I, I don't know if that'll all tie together. I just gave you suggestions for each scene on how to fix them, but you have to tie the story together. It's your story. Uh, if you want me to hire, if you want to hire me as a ghostwriter, that's a whole different thing. Um, but it, but if you're at your story, these are some ideas to fix this scene because the scene is really slow. Or it's just not working, or it's not doing what you think it wants you want it to do. And then if you can tie all that into the rest of the story problems, then that works. And so that's that's kind of my expectations from authors. I don't I don't want to rewrite their book for them, but I do want to identify problem areas, give them some ideas, hopefully getting their mind working so that they can put it in there with their own creation. Um, I, I guess you, a good way of uh, some of these, I mean, a lot of people will say, I, I'm not, I don't know, I'm not very, I, I think it's a formula. I don't believe in a formula. I believe more creativity. It's really, you know, it's just what we go back to is the expectations of the reader when he picks up this genre of book. You know, he expects, you know, the if it's a love story, he expects the lovers to meet. The lovers are probably going to break up at one point and then they're they're going to meet again at the end and either live happily ever after or not. And, you know, I think Nicholas Sparks is really good at not um, at the end of his books. And Dear John, for anyone who's read Dear John, is a really good example where they got in a love story. They broke up because of 9-11 and the war and he stayed in the war. And then she ends up marrying someone else and he's mad. And then I'm going to ruin the story for anyone. So anyone who wants to read Dear John. But basically, she marries this guy. He has cancer. He has a kid. She's a nice person. She loves him too. And John broke up with her. So she married this guy and he was bitter, but then he sees the whole picture at the end and he ends up getting, giving his fortune that his father gave him to help the guy survive cancer to live with his, the girl he loves. Um, and the movie actually ends a little bit more happier than the book, but you know, it's a nice feeling ending. It's not happily ever after the guy doesn't get the girl, but but um, it's a it's a it's a kind of a good feeling ending. So, but these are the things that are expected by the reader. They want a usually they want a good feeling ending, even if it's not the ending they really want. Um, I mean, there's problems with the Notebook too, right? Because she was she was engaged to marry this war hero, and then she ditches him for her old boyfriend that she hasn't heard for in 30 years. So, you know, if you look at it in a real situation, I was like, wow, that was a really rough thing to do. But uh, but it, you know, they they live forever. They live for the next 80 years together and had many kids, and it was great. So it has its own kind of happy ending. So, but um, and if you look at Star Wars, right? What is it a different movie, Star Wars? If it's not Darth Vader and the TIE fighter at the end trying to kill Luke, who's responsible for killing his father as far as he knows then. And it's just some other stormtrooper trying to peg into him. It's a different, it's a, it's a different ending because he doesn't, he's not, he doesn't get that engagement with the guy that kills his father. And the same thing goes through the whole series. You know, the bad guy is Darth Vader. And if they don't actually meet and fight in the second one, and especially in the third one, that 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 work, the whole story doesn't work, right? You gotta have you gotta have them come, you know, you gotta have that that one-on-one -on -one with the bad guy at the end and 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 figure it out. And and I, ideally you're doing a twist. It's not the same thing. It's not the, the cowboys showdown at the end every time. You know, those westerns, I like all those westerns too, but they get old when it's the same guy, same thing at the end, and the bad, good guy wins every time. So uh, you got to mix it up. You got to figure out some unique ways and some surprising and innovative ways to, to end these things. But uh, but I, I really believe in the system. Uh, as, I don't think it's a formula. I think it's a guideline. And if you if you can go through there and look at find five commandments, find an inciting incident, and a crisis question for your for your character, and then a, a surprising resolution, I think it I think it really works well. I found in the forty books that I've edited that I can I can usually convince the author that this 
way of writing this chapter is a little bit more compelling. And they'll usually go, you're right. And, and they're not going to stay. They, they never, even the formula guys who come to me never say it's more compelling. I don't know if I believe in your formula, but you did make it a better, better chapter. It's like, well, in my mind, that's what I use to do it. So. Yeah. I mean, formula is a funny thing. Like I do think there is such a thing as formulaic writing. Um, but I mean, look there, you could say the same thing about like architecture, like look at all these architects following the same principles to ensure their building doesn't fall down. Yeah. You need certain kinds of principles, but then you can exercise them in all kinds of new innovative ways. And it's not creative just to say, Oh, I'm not going to have a supporting wall here and let the house fall down. <laughs> right. That's not being original. I, and indeed I, am. Um, you know, I, I, I like writing in the in the crime genre, and there is kind of this divide between like genre writers and so-called real novelists. I think it's a false divide. I think Story Grid's good about recognizing that all writing is genre writing. Um, but it's, I mean, the, you know, what I think it, far from being unoriginal, one of the hardest things is how do I be original in a space that other geniuses have traveled many, many times before me, right? Well, one thing I do want to go back to, because I get a lot of questions about this, you know, a lot of people when they start out writing, they really are kind of terrified about like getting feedback and how do I deal with it? And so one of the things that I, I want to, I want to underline is um, like the goal is not necessarily to love getting critical feedback in the moment you get it. Like I, as you kind of hinted at, like, I definitely don't love it. I love it intellectually. Like, I know this is going to make it better, but emotionally, you know, you have the combination of, uh, this is my baby. And also, oh my gosh, it's going to be so hard to fix this. And I'm scared of doing the work. I'm scared if I can figure out how to fix it. And so, you know, when I would get stuff from you, um, usually what would happen is that I would sit there and pout to my wife and going, I'm not going to, I'm done with this. They can take it or leave it, but I wouldn't like write anything. I wouldn't, you know, say anything to you. I'd say, all right, I'm going to go to sleep, let it, <laughs> you know, let it fester. And then I would wake up inevitably the next day. And almost always it would be either you're right, or you're at least m kind of right. Like there's something that here that can be improved or that needs to be improved. Um, there was one draft though, where I really did feel is at the end of my rope, but I hit the point where I thought I, I, I asked the, the question I asked myself was I said, all right, if I could wave a wand and implement Randy's suggestions with no effort at all, would I do it? And I said, yeah, absolutely. In a heartbeat, I would do it. And then I realized, all right, well, then I'm just basically taking the easy way out. And I said, the book's too good to sell it out at this point. Like I need to put in the work to take it to that, the next level. And so I think a lot of just criticism, dealing with criticism is recognizing, A, it's not personal, particularly if you find editors who really believe in you and are trying to help you achieve the best thing you can do. And then second, just to recognize that um, you're doing it for a reason, which is you want to create the best product you can. And an editor's job is let me help get the best out of you. And I feel like that's sort of what we did uh, during this, this process. No, and I agree. And I, and the other thing I love about, I didn't know this when I started editing, I was just trying to figure out how I was going to make my living while I became a writer. And, uh, but I, I really love it. And like your second one, when it came back, I would read some of the chapters that I, I, I gave, you know, I, I just kind of identified as maybe it could have, could have worked a little differently. And I would read your rewrite like, this is so much better. What a better, what a, what a completely better idea. This changes the whole book you know, and, and, and some of the things I didn't even think about you, I, I think, so they surprised me because I didn't think of them. And I, I just said, I think this is a problem. And then I would read it. I was like, no, he did it. And I was like, it was really, I just love, I just love reading that. And then, as you said, at some point, whatever you do to it is only going to make it marginally better. And so you just say it's ready. And especially ready to go to, you know, the next level. Uh, that's what happened with my other book that got published. Uh, I think got published in February this year. The, that, that author, you know, she, she was, was very resistant to, 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 to let it go. And so she kept sending me another edition and I was like, this is ready. And it's like, well, you have a couple of things, notes in there. I was like, 
you can implement those notes, but it's ready to go to a publisher right now. And the and the reality is, I'm just I'm an editor. I work for StoryGood, but I also I'm only contracted to StoryGood. I I work I don't work I do I freelance outside of StoryGood too. And in this case, she actually found me through the StoryGood webpage, but she went through a different publisher because StoryGood wasn't up at the time. And uh, and so I was like, I they're going to have their own editors look at. All right. And they may have some different changes. They're definitely going to have some different changes. I don't know what what kind of structural changes they're going to have. And, and so uh, she, I said, this is ready to go to a publisher. I can, I can tweak this all over, but th- a publisher is going to love this book. And I was right. They, she sent it out there. They sent this incredible, like this, this is great. I, f- I felt a little bit justified because their editor said test had, had asked her to change a few things that I had asked her to change. She's like, ah, that's good. And then there's some things they one or two other things they wanted to change as well. But um, for the most part, it took her a month to make those changes. There were small changes. And she was like, she was like really super over the moon and it was published within uh, another six months. So what's the difference for you in terms of editing your own work versus editing other people? So I use, uh, I, I use Scrivener for anyone who's a Scrivener user. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar. What do we talk about that? Are you Scrivener too? Yeah, I use it too. So I'm actually uh, putting together a class on how to use Scrivener with, with story grid in conjunction and how to use the metadata and stuff like that. Cause I'm a, cause I went to college back in 1987 or six when they invented Excel and I was taking engineering classes. I, so as the first version of Excel, they got with this new program called Excel. Everyone has to learn it. And I got taught Excel. And then I dropped out of college and joined the army. And uh, then they got computers in the army and they started using word and Excel. And my commander who had finished college, but never learned Excel because it wasn't mandatory back then was like, oh, I got to use this Excel program because the commander wants it in there. And it's such, I, it's such a headache. It was like, oh, I knew how to use Excel. Then I became a secretary, in a, a Green Beret secretary for, for like a month uh, while I fixed everyone's, I taught all the officers how to use Excel and I, and I fixed it and everything. But uh, Scrivener to me is a kind of an expanded Excel and I'm a data kind of geek. And my dad's a computer programmer, me, I got it from him. And uh, so Scrivener just helps me organize everything really well with with uh, all the story grid aspects of it. So I have a whole thing that I use when I'm writing, which is five commandments. I pretty much use the metadata with five commandments and the value change, and that's it. And I may I may even go the, as far as to plot some of the main scenes out with that before I even get through it. And then when I get all the way through it, I'll go back and make sure I have the five commandments. And then I'll do the whole story grid sheet, which I also put in the metadata too. So when I'm editing my own stuff, I go back and use the story grid spreadsheet. And just like I would edit anyone else's, I take a break. I put it aside so that it's almost fresh when I see it. And I'm like, oh, I wrote that. I'm really good. Uh, and then I was like, who wrote that? That's not me. Um, but then I, I do the, the whole spreadsheet, which is, uh, is outlined in, in Sean Coyne's book, The Story Grid. And he, he, they got lots of podcasts on it and they got some videos on it. So if any, and that's all, all that podcast and the videos are free. So you can do all that. I actually just finished uh, a video series for story grid. And I think they're going to, they're going to charge for it a little bit, but I finished one on the full scap. Another story grid editor finished one on the, uh, the spreadsheet. And so those are available on there for not too much. If you guys are interested in that. And I'm also um, putting together a Scrivener and StoryGrid merge so you can work the StoryGrid with the Scrivener and kind of seamlessly work together. Uh, but yeah, my, my, my process is I write it. I, I actually plan it with, this, with the five commandments for the acts in mind and the key scenes. And then uh, I go, once I'm finished with it, I'll put it aside, then I'll come back and I'll use the whole StoryGrid method, just like I edit anyone else's stuff and go through it. I won't write my own report. I'm not that. That's that. I'm not that. Uh, not going to torture myself like that. But uh, but I will. I will uh, I'll, I'll take a note of all the conventions and all the obligatory moments that I'm supposed to have for that genre, and then I'll do the five commandments of each scene and the acts, and I'll just work through the whole thing. Now you said it was uh, kind of a self-editing. I don't know. I I don't know. I mean, I think there's a way to use the story grid for writing. And then there's a way, like, especially for planners, 
and also if you don't want to hire an editor or if you want to make it cleaner before you give it to your editor to self-edit and then there's like the editing version so i think there's like the edit the editor there's like Sean Coyne and his group of StoryGrid editors, of which I'm a part, have put together this library of books that can just level your craft up to amazing uh, levels, really, for lack of a better word. They're just, they have these little mini books that are 50, 100 pages long about specific things, point of view, obligatory moments, all these things. And they actually have one, hey, this is this is kind of the standard ex expectations for readers for an action book, a thriller, horror, and all these, they have all these things that are for sale on their website and on Amazon that are just a, a library of wealth of knowledge on how to be a writer, how to self-edit your own work. And a lot of this stuff is free on their podcast. They have, like I said, free videos on their webpage. And uh, it's just amazing. It's just amazing everything they put together. And they've done this pretty much in the last two years because they started putting it together when they opened the publishing company, right before they opened the publishing company, they started making these books and then they incorporated it into the publishing company. It's a lot of nonfiction more than anything. And all of that stuff is just, you can't have too much information on how to, I mean, you can, there's way too much stuff out there, especially with the, with Google and everything, but the, this stuff is like right on point and it walks you through step-by-step. And I would recommend anyone, uh, you know, using the StoryGrid spreadsheet to self-edit is only going to make your book better. And it, don't get me wrong, it's a headache. It, take, it took me a month to do your first book. After I was familiar with your book, it took me a week, you know. But the first time I did it, I was just like, oh, okay, let's get into it, you know. And, and I, what the report was like, what, 40 pages long or something, I think? Or it whatever. was a beast. Yeah. Yeah, it got shorter as it went along. But but that first one was like, I, I, I had like suggestions for new beginnings and new endings. And, you know, maybe this, maybe you have too many characters. Maybe you don't need this one. And maybe this one doesn't need to be that what you think it is. And it should be a ninja. And I always like ninjas and dragons. So I always try to incorporate that and everything. In fact, my biggest, my biggest accomplishment as an editor for the book that got published called Nexus Point um, by Kay Pimpernella uh, is a science fiction time travel book. And she had uh, a group of characters called the Time Rangers, which were the protagonists. One of them was a leader, a commander of the Time Rangers, and they went back in time and stopped people from changing time. And uh, I said, you know what? You should have, uh, you should you should start the book with like how the training of the Time Rangers is and all these things that they're supposed to learn, and at the graduation ceremony you should have a Time Ranger creed like recognizing that I volunteer as a Time Ranger, fully knowing the hazards of my chosen profession. I will always endeavor to protect the timeline. Well, in the Rangers, in my in the American American Ranger battalions. <laughs> They have a ranger creed and it it basically goes it says everything i just said except for the time part and so i said hey here's a ranger creed you could possibly use and i was like and I, she's like did you steal this from the real rangers and i was like i i mean steal i mean i don't think any i've seen i've read books that were rangers where they put the creed and they said the creed as part of the book so i don't think anyone has a problem there's no one copywriting the ranger creed but uh, I think you could um, you could absorb this and and you know and figure it out and make and so she did, and there's very it's very obvious that it's there's pieces that are in there, but you know it's I I, I read it I, when I read it the the final version I was like I am so proud of you this is amazing it's my favorite book now it's got the Ranger Creed in it I didn't get to put the Ranger Creed in yours but the second book the sequel we'll try to work it in there. You know, I, it'll probably be a lot easier for you to talk me to ninjas just because I've been obsessed with them since I was a kid. I'm sure they're going to show up at, at, at some point. But um, one, I mean, one thing that's worth mentioning is that often precisely because, you know, the tool is so much like it helps you kind of break down the essence of a story. I think some people can think like it's only for people who sort of plan out and plot out their novels beforehand. Um, but I think one way you can definitely use it is because uh, so just to set it up, 
I'm sort of somewhere in the middle. I like to have a kind of general idea where I'm going in a story. I need to have a general idea of where I'm going or I don't end up anywhere. Um, and in fact, when we were talking about the follow-up to I Am Justice, you asked a question, which was a, the perfect question asked, which is, all right, what's the all is lost moment? Like, when is your character going to reach a point where everything that they're after just seems impossibly far away? And that, uh, I haven't told you exactly how I worked that out, but uh, I will at some point. But that's the question that kind of got me to the heart. As soon as I heard the question, I go, if I can't answer that, I've, I'm going to unlock the key to this book. And that's exactly what happened. So it can help you in the front end, even if you don't rigorously go through and kind of work out even your, you know, big, your major scenes, it can kind of help you ask the right questions uh, as you write. But you can also just be, you sit down, bat out something on your laptop, and then you go back and kind of analyze it. Because, um, you know, I work with a lot of nonfiction authors. And I used to really be rigorous about there's a writing process. First, you think about what you want to say, then you outline it, then you draft it, then you edit it. And what I realized is that a lot of people were getting stuck in the process. And I thought, you know, the process is just a tool. This is your toolbox. I do think that it, for, uh, eventually you'll have to outline, but you don't have to outline beforehand afterwards if you feel like yeah this isn't fully clear okay go break down what you actually wrote into an outline and then see if it makes sense but if that's what's keeping you from getting stuff on the page just start putting down words um and i think the story grid is great in that it's you can use it in that sort of flexible way that fits your own style like it's not there to kind of dictate to you it's there to empower you um with just all the tools you need to kind of judge and assess what you're doing no, I, I think there's there's definitely there's probably a million ways to use this, but I I, I try to feel out the authors and, and, and that are especially if they haven't finished the they've only written like ten or twenty thousand words and they kind of got a half half of an outline together, and uh, I've I've worked with that. I also I've been on people have taped our conversations and put them on their pot my my conversation with the author and they put it on their own personal podcast. I got. Some links on the webpage if people want to see how I work with with authors. But um, basically, if you're a planner, you could. Some planners get too; they just plan and they never write, right? So ideally, you plan it. You plan it either the whole outline, chapter by chapter, or act by act. In my case, I usually plan act by act. I do the five commandments of each act. That's kind of my thing, and then I look at a bunch of the conventional this the, the obligatory moments, and the all is lost moment, the inciting attack at the beginning of the book, the, you know, confrontation between the hero and the villain. Those are really important parts. Everyone's expecting to see them. If you don't have the initial hook for the book, you know, the reader never might never get to anything else. If you don't get those in the first couple of chapters. Um, and, and then if you don't have that, the standoff at the end in some way, you're going to, you're going to piss the reader off. Uh, and, and, and if you don't have the all lost moment, then there's no going to, not going to be enough change for the book to be a significant moment in the reader's life. So those are the three big ones that I always try to look for. The other ones are things that I can adjust on the way. So uh, that's the way I feel. So I think you can write. I mean, if you're just one of those guys that have all these ideas, I would just write, just write your freaking book and then come back and self edit with using these, these, these tools. Um, if you're halfway like me and you, we can, you know, look at the core scenes and, and make sure that they, their work. Cause, cause I just don't want to start over. You know, if you write everything, if it, if you just vomit on the page and there's no organization to it and your scenes that should be at the end or at the beginning, or they're totally missing and you have to build up to them because you have to build up to the confrontation between Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader. You can't just have it at the, in the middle and you, no one really knows how bad Darth Vader is and how, you know, new Luke Skywalker is. It's not going to work as well as, as the buildup. So you can't just, oh, I don't have an all is lost moment. I don't have a confrontation at the end. I'll just stick it in without the buildup. And, you know, if you're going to do it in an innovative way, you also have to build up for that. What's the gift of the protagonist that they're going to overcome this supposedly superior and strength, you know, and numbers bad guy? How's he going to win in a way that's going to make sense and surprise the reader and be cool? Um, you have to, you kind of have to prepare for that eventually. 
Now you can write your whole thing book and then you have to stick stuff in the in the thing. And as you know, that's that's tough. You have to go alter a bunch of different chapters to build up to figure that out. Um, but it depends on the way you write. Some people, that's the way they write. They write all their stuff. And, you know, the guy, uh, what's his name? Um, Jack Reacher. Uh, Lee Child. Lee Child. He said he wrote he wrote one and then he, he did one rewrite and that's it. And then he sent it. And that's awesome. I don't think a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, if you, yeah, I mean that you have to really kind of have every element of storytelling, like ingrained in your soul to do yeah. that. I, 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 I think, you know, that there's a, 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 one of my new favorite authors is a guy, Don Winslow. He did a book, the power of the dog, a whole trilogy in the cartels. Yeah. That was the first one. He's done a lot of stuff and he tells the story of he's writing that first cartel book and he has 2000 pages of wow. material. Now he does an outline. Uh, he does a lot of research, but no outlining. And he ends up 2000 pages going, I don't, I can't do this. I don't know like how I'm going to fix this story. Eventually, you know, it turns into a like 500 page, just one of the best books I've ever read, but that's the kind of, that's usually how it plays for people who are more just kind of seat of their pants writing um, that you have to do a lot of work on the back end. But sometimes, I mean, the reason that I can't fully uh, outline is I just can't really envision, um, you know, who the characters are, the, the kind of logic of how they get from A to Z in a realistic way, unless I let it evolve. I just have to have, you know, the kind of big directional things worked out beforehand and all of that's subject to change too, right? Like, you know, you can, you can plan and it gives you a plan of attack, but you can always discover something better along the way. But I think the thing that I have learned, you know, through a decade and a half of writing is I always know there's going to be a lot of back end work, right? So I'm not, I'm not fooling myself about like, all right, this draft is going to be perfect. And then I can just set it aside, like just being completely okay there. Right? Everything is fixable. And I really need that right now with my current one, because there's so many gems in what's coming out. But, uh, you know, I look back, I go, all right, I know I'm going to have to come back and fix a ton of stuff at this scene, right? Like there's, there's really, there's no choices that the main character's making or um, one of the things you point out, this is small, but I, I, it just occurred to me is one of the biggest mistakes I was making in my book is that at crucial points, it wasn't my protagonist who was driving the story. Um, and it was, it was subtle. Like it wasn't jumping out where she's just standing around and stuff's happening to her, but too much of crucial changes in, of the story were kind of driven by the choices of other characters once in a while by coincidence, uh, though I tried to catch most of that, but realizing that as much as possible, you, you want it to be the protagonist for better, for worse, who's, um, even when the kind of lay of the land is being directed by the antagonist, right? Uh, you want the protagonist really moving the story forward, responsible for overcoming the obstacles, responsible for making these crucial decisions. And so, um, but, you know, just like I have the confidence that, all right, I'll spot those problems when I go back through it and I, you know, I can change them and not feeling like if the draft doesn't come out perfectly, I've screwed up. It's no, it's just, it's a lot easier to edit something that exists than something that doesn't exist. No, exactly. And I, so I just finished um, helping this uh, one author write his book. He's, it's coming out in January. It's called The Wise Investor. It's a fiction book. Um, and, uh, you know, I spent a month really between the two of us. We worked on it for seven months and it's finished. And, it's, and he found a publisher and it's being published in January. And we worked together hand in hand. The first month of December was a whole month. And we spent 10 hours on Zoom over like three or four sessions. And we outlined the whole book, uh, how we thought it would go. We, it, it changed. Don't get me wrong. But we said, these are the five commandments for each act, for the beginning act and the, the any payoff and the middle build. This is the, these are the, what we think are going to be the, the uh, conventions and the obligatory moments right now, because I, I would ask him, I was like, what do you think this moment of, you know, where he loses everything, where is that at? What, what is, what is he, what is he at in his life, you know, and, and how is this going to work and who's his mentor and, and things like that. And I asked all these questions and we got through, we got a great outline and then we started writing it 
in January or February, actually. So it really took six months. We took off January off and we were getting four to eight chapters a, a month, you know, 15 word, 1500 word chapters. And it was just come, because of the outline and the way we had it, it was just flowing. And sometimes we wrote a chapter and we're like, that's not, that's, that shouldn't go here. That's not working. We need, that just needs to go take that out of the outline, but we need to replace it with something or, or do we, and then we talk about it and, and then he, then he'd go on. And, but really we wrote it chronologically chapter by chapter and, and, it, and it, we finished it that way. And uh, then, then I did another, uh, I, I got a friend because I was so close to it after, from helping him co-edit the whole thing. As we went, I had another editor come in and, and look at it and say, okay, I was like, but I love that scene. He's like, no, that's not the right way for this thing to go. And then uh, seriously, by June 1st, we were doing the final edits. By July, he was pitching it to uh, publishing companies. By August, he had a publisher and it's supposed to come out in January. I think I'm going to get a hardback like next month or something like that. So yeah, I mean, really the plan, the planning, if you're not a planner, obviously it's not going to work for you. But if you do like that and you can just, like I said, we had the five commandments for each. And then we just like, Hey, where are the, these points going to be? And, and we just, things came to us as we were writing the chapters because we knew where we wanted to end up. And that's the most important thing I do when I work with authors that, especially if they don't have a finished product yet is I'm like, what is the, what is the ending you see? How do you see the character? Let's, let's talk about your character. Okay. Blah, blah, blah. He says this, he's, this is where he starts out. Okay. Let's skip the middle. Where's the, where is he going to end up? What's his mentality when he ends up? Who's going to be there with him when he ends up? You know, what's, what's got to happen in the ending in your mind? And then how do we get there? And, and what, what are the steps that need to happen for him to get to this place in life where he can actually fight if it's going to be an action one where he can fight this guy? Because he doesn't start most of these hero, especially the fantasy ones, it's a kid or an untrained dude or something, or he doesn't know any magic or he doesn't know how to use a sword. How does he get to fighting the ice King or the night King at the end, you know, uh, of, you know, this, the books, this book or this series of books, how, what does he have to do? He has to learn how to fight. He has to, you know, get experience fighting. He has to, you know, all this stuff. And how do we get there? And what are the key scenes that are really, these key scenes have been seen by the, Fans of your genre book, they've been seen a million times. They've read billions of books, uh, and uh, and 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 so you need to figure out how to do this in a really an innovative way that's going to interest them. And like, oh, that's cool. I didn't think about that. And and how do you and just think about that? Because once you think about that, you go to sleep for a couple of days on it. And you go, oh, what, what about this? And that's a stupid idea. And then you go to sleep on it, and then they're like, oh, that's a good idea. So I mean. It's it, 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 you don't have to follow whatever outline you come up with, but if you come up with one, it gets you thinking about those problems. And then when you get there, you may already have a couple ideas. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, one of the, the secrets I found to creative thinking is that if you sit around trying to have a good idea, you will be sitting for a long time. But if you sit around trying to have an idea and then you play with it and you build on it and you question it, and you challenge it. And, you know, you throw, once you have a starting point, you can get to a great end point. Um, but the, it's, it's usually, you know, we have high standards for our ideas, which is good. It helps us uh, on the back end when we're editing and judging our work, but that can paralyze you. And so, you know, I often will just start with, all right, here's kind of what's the most obvious thing that I could do here. And then just toy with that, you know, take that as a starting point and, play with it, push up against it. Like you say, let it, let it sit overnight a few times and uh, usually can evolve something out of it. The other thing is, you, you know, if you're writing and you're stuck on a scene, but you know what you want to do with it, but you're stuck, it's not working for you, then go on to the next one. And if you have a good editor, when he reads that, he's going to go, okay, well, how do I make this fit in better? And how do I make this better? And so it's, you know, two eyes, two, four eyes is better than two, you know, and a guy that's edited, you know, a bunch of books and is a good editor is going to give you a couple of suggestions and how to do that. And which once again, we've talked about this, you don't have to take the editor's suggestions, but they might get you thinking like he, I knew this is a problem. 
he gave me some suggestions. I don't like them all, but you know what? Let's take a little bit of that one, a little bit of that one, stick that in there and throw this in there. And that's new. That's new. And it, that works. And, and then you got, then you get fixed that chapter and you don't have to dwell on it for like two weeks. Like I can't get this chapter, you know, you know what it's supposed to do. It's maybe not your most fun chapter to write either. Sometimes they get stuck on just the, the chapters. Like, how do I make, this is like a really boring chapter. I don't really want to write it, but that's the problem. It's boring. How do I make it not boring? I'm having a problem figuring that out. Let's just leave it. I know what it's supposed to do. It's got to supply a clue or a, a, a suspect or something. It, that's that's You know that's part of the story that needs to be in there. Maybe my editor, who my, my, co, my co-thinker, can figure a solution for that out. And I have, I actually, I often have clients that are writing their sequels, like the the girl, the the woman who wrote Nexus Point. She off, she's finishing her sequel off right now. And she's like, hey, this is the situation, blah, 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 superhuman, do, 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 time travel, blah, blah, blah. What do you think? I was like, oh, well, how about this? This is is this. And then she's like, oh, yeah, okay, thanks. And and I'll just throw that. I mean, it's just an email. Cause I know she's going to give it to me to edit someday. And, and uh, so, so I, I answer clients like that all the time. Yeah. In fact, one of the things I should do, um, I have, there's a, the Ayn Rand center UK for those of you guys who are supporters, they're going to have a book club around my book and they're going to do, I forget how many weeks on it. And I'm going to appear at the beginning and the end. And I think given that everybody will have read at the end, one thing I'm going to do, Randy, is I'm going to go back through our emails and give them some examples of the kinds of feedback that, you know, what I had originally written, some of the feedback you had given and and kind of share with them um, some concrete examples of exactly what you're talking about. Cause I think it really, it'll be illustrative to people about the value of working with an editor, how ideas kind of take shape and change and, uh, and, and, also, hopefully it'll encourage them saying, oh man, Watkins, that started out really bad and ended up really good. Maybe I can write something too. Where, where are you going? Hey, when are you going to do these book tours? Um, this is a, an online book group that oh, okay. um, a, a group that I work with uh, is going to be hosting. Oh, okay. And uh, so I'm not that involved with it. I'm just going to show up online for a couple of Zoom sessions. Um, okay. I, I do want to do some uh, traveling to promote the book. So we'll have to see. Uh, unfortunately, all of the big book conferences, like all the crime writers Man. conferences, they take place when my wife is traveling or where I have other arrangements wow. this year. So I wanted to go to Thriller Fest, but I will not be able yeah. to make that work. But um, hey, I can, I can, I might be able to show up too. I'm going to be in the States. Uh, I don't know if you didn't tell anyone I'm in Europe right now, but I might be, able to be in the States for the next couple months through Christmas. So I'm willing to come online, especially if you want to do a, a, a dual talk, I can do that. Awesome. Yeah. In fact, I'll make a note of that. All right. Well, great, Randy. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks again for all the help with the novel. I'm super excited to have it out in the world. I think that our hard work, like I can see it in the early reviews. You know, I've heard it from dozens of people behind the scenes. We've already seen about um, 15 uh, or more uh, reviews on Goodreads. Hopefully we'll see a lot more once it goes live on Amazon, but um you know, I'm really excited and I'm excited to work on the follow-up. I think um, people will be really, I, I know that people are already interested in sort of where these characters end up in the future. So I'm interested in figuring out how can people learn more about what you do? Yeah, sure. So I'm a StoryGrid certified editor. So I'm uh, one of the editors on the StoryGrid webpage, uh, storygrid.com, where you can get all this free information I was talking about and the podcast links and things like that. Um, I'm also, my own webpage is called randysurls.com, R A N D Y S U R L E S.com. And that's what got some bunch of testimonials. I think maybe you should put a testimonial on there. And, uh, and, uh, I got, um, I also got, I also write about writing with Scrivener uh, to end story grid. I have a lot of articles on how to use, do that before I make my uh, course on it. Um, also I have a podcast about analyzing television series uh, and like game of Thrones, uh, killing Eve, um, the umbrella, the umbrella Academy uh, analyze them using the story grid and saying, you know, 
you know what, this could have been better if they would kind of applied some of the story grid things to it, or this was perfect because it applied all the story grid stuff. And so I have that. Um, I did it with two of my other story grid editors, Melanie Newman and uh, pa- Parul Bavishi, who are also story grid editors that I met when I when I was certifying. And we did one. It's called the uh, the the Story Grid Showrunners Podcast. And so there, that's that, that's how they can reach me. All right. Thanks again. And uh, as always, people, you can stay up to date by going to donswriting.com and sign up for the newsletter. Talk next time.